Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Mastermind Academy. Today I'm a little uh, I'm a little late getting to things. I actually just walked in the house from work, maybe uh, maybe eight or nine minutes ago. So I'm uh, I'm uh, trying to get up to speed right now. So let me know. I didn't get to do a sound test. I usually do a sound test beforehand to make sure all the sound levels are good. Let me know if you hear me well. Let me know if you can hear the music in the background. Let me know if you can see uh, the normal things that you usually see. So I didn't get to do that. Cool. Sounds good. I am glad. Little fluster. We just had a long, long work day plus a few, a few events. You know, we had some people, some going away parties and retirement parties and stuff. So we spent a little time, you know, uh, eating a little bit of food, talking to people, having a little bit of fun. Lost track of time just a little bit, um, but I made it. I'm here. I made it. How's everyone doing tonight? How's everyone's, you know, uh, Labor Day weekend? How? How's everyone been since then? I hope everybody's doing good. Is anyone looking forward to this upcoming weekend? Anybody doing anything cool? Um, my brother, uh, so my brother actually coaches for uh, the University of Maryland football team. So um, this is this is kind of new for me and my family. So we get to go to a lot of college games. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for every weekend, every Saturday, every Friday and Saturday that they have a game. Um, I get to head out and check out some some cool games. So I'm excited this weekend to, uh, I think they're playing Syracuse this weekend. Should be pretty fun. I'm <clears throat> um, cool, cool, cool. All right, yeah, so tonight we're gonna be talking about networking and security. So this is still gonna be, this is this might feel like an extension of the Linux piece that we've been working on. Um, we'll be talking about this in the paradigm of all of the tools that we'll be using to check out some of these things. They'll all be within Linux, so we'll, we'll be diving deeper into Linux, like I said. That Linux piece, although we only had two dedicated courses we will be diving more into Linux. You'll be learning more Linux commands and more Linux tools throughout the entire process. But yeah, that's what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, these aren't Linux specific things. These networking principles um, kind of apply across the board. It's gonna be very high level. Um, networking can get pretty deep. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about the things that I think that we need to know right now. We'll also get a lot of networking work done while we're going through the, um, I believe it's the introduction to cloud computing stuff. Uh, so once we're diving into that, you get to do some hands-on networking there. So I don't want to double it up um, on there. We'll talk about some of the deeper things there. But tonight, yeah, we're just talking about protocols, um, you know, various um, networking tools, talk about DNS, how the internet works, uh, talk about some security practices, talk about some security tools and protocols around that as well. We headed out to a wedding. I haven't been to a wedding. I don't know. I just went to a wedding. Um, I think like two weeks ago. Weddings are always fun. They're always, they're always pretty nice. Volleyball on Friday. What do you play? Um, do you play? Is it is it beach volleyball? Is it indoor volleyball? I know here in Baltimore we actually have some beach volleyball spots uh, right around the harbor that you can play. There's a few leagues for that. Um, it looks pretty cool. It looks pretty tiring. I don't really like doing stuff in the sand. Evacuating. You had no power all weekend. I assume that means you're down in Florida. Um, so or. Or I guess I guess it passed Florida, so I guess you're up a little bit north. Um, that's crazy. Hopefully you get some power back uh, pretty soon. I'm assuming I guess I'm assuming you're watching this on your phone, so hopefully I don't, I don't use up all your all your battery. Let me check this out. Let me make sure I got everything pulled up since I got a late start. Cool. Good, good. There we go. All right, so we went a little bit over last time. Hopefully this time, I know I say it almost every time. Hopefully this time, I'll get you out a little bit early. Hopefully I'll get you out. Uh, maybe we'll give you up to a half an hour back. So I'm going to try to get through a lot of this pretty quickly tonight. Um, I actually need to start. I've been editing um, a, a pretty cool YouTube video for you all. Um, probably for two weeks now. Um, so I'm hoping to finish that up by Friday. So I want to work on that tonight later, a little bit later. So I'm hopefully we can get through this um, because this, a lot of this doesn't go too deep. Um, and I think we can get through it a lot faster than we got through the lab. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is one of those things I, I debated on whether or not I wanted to stick this in here. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, the OSI model. And I, I actually, you know what's funny? It's been so long since I dealt with the OSI model. I'm not even sure what it stands for. I think it's the open um, something interface. Let's look it up. Let's look it up. Um, what does the OSI model stand for? 
I don't even know. Yeah, the open systems interconnection. Cool. So we're gonna talk about the open systems interconnection. I've always called it the OSI model. Um, I learned this years and years ago. It is it's something that I think you all should be familiar with. That's why I've thrown it in here. Um, but it's not necessarily super duper important that you memorize this entire thing. I'll kind of let you know what from it you should memorize uh, that you should be familiar with. Um, but I thought it was important to introduce you to it. Um, but basically, the OSI model is just a way to kind of describe the patterns of um, of network of, of what happens with two networked computers um, and kind of talk about the different pieces uh, that that you know, data moves through to be able to get from one computer to another. Um, and there are seven layers of the OSI model and they're all depicted here. Um, this is a pretty good little graph here. And I think maybe, let me see if I can see where I got it from. Can I image somewhere else? Um, I'll send you the link to, whoops, I'll send you the link to this so you can use it as a reference. But I think it's good to be familiar with this. Uh, you may get some interview questions on this. I haven't had to talk about the OSI model in years, in a really, really long time. But um, it, it, it is a question that may come up um, about certain uh, levels of it. But we can start from the top down. So from the, t the top is actually layer seven. So this, this application uh, section is actually layer seven, goes all the way down to layer one. Um, and different layers handle different pieces of that um, of that network connection, different pieces of what happens when you, you know, make a connection between two network computers and send data over it. And the first one is is the application layer. So application layer, that's kind of exactly what we're looking at now. This is the one that you interact with every day. This is this is your applications. This is Google Chrome. This is Microsoft Office. This is that this is anything, you know, that's it's, that's connected, you know, over the web, over a network um, and, and any front end application that you see um, that you're using. This is the application layer. Um, and it kind of gets important to talk about this. I would actually say most of the time um, at least in my experience, most of the time when you're doing DevOps, you'll probably be dealing with level three and up, um, level three and up, maybe level four and up. So I'll kind of focus on these and make sure you kind of really understand these and understand really just the, not even really understand them, but understand the differences between all of them, um, specifically because a lot of times you'll use them just to kind of identify where an issue is happening. So you may ha hear someone say, hey, you know, I think we have an, a problem, you know, and you may start digging into it and someone may say, hey, it's all, uh, I think it's on the application layer and you may do some more work and you're like, oh no, it's actually not the application at all. It's all the way down on the network layer. Um, and that kind of gives you, you know, a, a model in which to attack uh, solving it. So that's what we're gonna use it for here. But again, the application layer is just the, exactly what it sounds like it is the application it's what you see um it is it is that application you're using making requests out to the inner uh, out to the internet it is the end user layer and then next we have the presentation layer the presentation layer is the syntax layer this is where some translation happens this is where things get uh, encrypted this is the, where things get encoded this is where things get um you know, converted from, you know, the data that they are down to, you know, ones and zeros as well. Um, and that's just, just a presentation layer. So these are gonna be a thing like SSL. You're gonna learn about all these protocols later on in this course uh, or later on tonight, actually. So SSL, SSH, um, IMAP, FTP, these are these are various protocols, um, various um, encoding um, formats and things like that. So that's what the presentation layer does. The session layer, um, is is pretty interesting and the the session layer and transport layer i was actually very interested to see that they put tcp and udp down here in the tra in the transport layer um, sometimes you'll see those in the session layer as well but the session layer is kind of where session activity uh resides uh it's not important that you understand what that is right now i would i would take some time and dive into each of these but this is where um information uh port connections and and um and your socket um your sockets get get connected to and things like that. That's where the session, that's what goes on in the session layer. It would be very hard in the amount of time that we have tonight to help you understand exactly everything that goes on in the session layer. But um, these 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 things happen there. We've got the transport layer. Um, we'll talk about TCP and UDP, but these are protocols that send data. TCP being one that is a uh, safe um, it's got it's got some package protection packet protection so um you know the packets 
are complete when they were when you know a computer will send over you know a packet of data um and sometimes you can lose those packets not in tcp you can't um it does some packet verification to make sure it is complete uh udp is faster so this is usually done with like video encoding or, or sending video files um, and serving up video content udp uh, does not have that packet verification so it's much faster but you may drop packets you may have an incomplete set of data um, but this is your transport layer this is your end-to-end -end connections um that's what they're talking about in the transport layer. The network, so you have your packets. We were just talking about packets. Um, this is when all of your, you know, your IP and ICMP stuff gets set. Um, and so your networking layer, that's where, you know, that's where all the the nitty gritty of, of a lot of things we're gonna talk about tonight, that's kind of where they all happen. That's where all the, the things get set up. That's where all the routing um, and, and et cetera happens, uh, usually via software, whereas the level below it, the data link layer, that's kind of where it happens via hardware. So things like ethernet, um, switches and bridges, so that, that kind of um, hands-on data link layer. And then the last layer is the physical layer, which is your actual physical structure. So this is, you know, this is your, your ethernet switches and your um your wireless your wireless hubs and repeaters and this is the actual you know the actual cables that are getting plugged in etc so that physical layer is the actual hardware it's like hands-on physical things so if something is going wrong in the physical layer that means something's wrong with your actual hardware your 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 tangible uh, uh your, the thing that you can touch the thing that you can grab the thing that you can see um and so there's a lot that kind of go into each of these, um, but like I said, you'll probably spend a lot of your time in the top four as like the the modern day DevOps engineer probably spends your day in the top four. Uh, if you're a sysadmin, um, if your job title is a systems administrator um, or like a data center administrator or something, you're probably spending your day in the lower four. I think I think they call this the the upper stack and the lower stack or something like that. Um, but again, it's been a while. It's not important that you memorize all of this stuff, but I thought it was important to introduce you to kind of starting out, um, especially because it has, once we get done tonight and you know a little bit more about what these protocols are, It'll make a little more sense, and I think you'll understand a little bit more, um, but I will have a link for you for that. All right, so one of the most important things we're gonna talk about tonight, one of the things that's probably the easiest to hop straight into, but probably the most difficult to truly understand and get a grasp on in like once you're once you're in it and, and doing it and you've got to make changes you know in in real life you realize that it's not quite as simple as it was when it was taught to you so i'm gonna go through the the basic you can see up in the corner here even the image has basic dns because that you know at, at very high levels this is all dns is but it gets much deeper than this so we'll dive a little bit deeper after this but dns what is it this is how the internet works as you know it so this is called the domain name system domains being um those addresses that you're used to so like google.com or uh, mastermind.io these are domains so um the issue here is that web browsers actually actually interact through internet protocol addresses. So um, I think a lot of you have probably heard of IP addresses. That is an internet protocol address. And this is how web browsers know how to interact and network and send data. So these IP addresses are a set of, uh, well, um, of up to like 12 numbers. Um, but you know that's not good for you to remember that's not that's not easy for a human to remember and that's where we have you know d these domain names so what needs to happen is um when you type in www.google.com your web browser needs to know how to translate that into an ip address it needs to know how to uh to to change that into a number so that it can access you know the right the correct servers and the servers where that uh, information is um, and so that's what it does. It translates the domain. Um, so we have mywebsite.com and it translate that it translates that to an IP address, um, an IP address which looks like this. Um, and that that IP address is basically, you know, just like a home address. It tells your computer exactly where to go to get the information that you need. And so that's what this this diagram is here, this infographic is here. So you're the user and you go to your computer and you type in www.google.com and that request actually, it, there's there's some more that happens in here, but your 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 computer actually checks locally. It says, hey, do I know where google.com goes? Uh, have I saved this information? It says, nope, I don't know where that information is. I don't have that information. It goes out to your ISP. ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. So this might be Comcast, Verizon, or 
or uh, I guess AT and T for some people, um, or I think I think there's Cox High Speed Internet. There's tons of internet providers, but that's what your ISP is, Internet Service Provider, and they have um, they have a name, they have a recursive name server, they have a DNS resolver. You know, at your ISP, your connection goes through them. It goes through and figures out where an authoritative um, name server, what an authoritative name server is, and it gets information from that authoritative name server. So that's that's something that sits over here. We're gonna talk about what name servers are, but name servers, these authoritative name servers, are the places where um, they're the source of truth for what domain name uh, translates to which IP address. So there's a mapping that happens whenever you buy it, whenever you purchase a domain, you know, if you buy www. If I bought AaronBrooks.com, I would have to set up, uh, I would have to set up that mapping. I would have to, you know, get either a server or a place to host my website. And I would need to get an IP address from the hosting provider. And I would need to provide that um, to my registrar. Um, and registrar being the, the people that I purchased the domain from. And the authoritative name servers will pick that up um, over time, um, and it'll do some it'll do some translations with the recursive name server. This recursive name server right here will actually cache a lot of the stuff in here, so it's not always making requests over to it. Um, and then that's how your computer gets the information. So it goes out. It says, "Hey, I ha I'm looking for the IP address for Google.com. Do you know what it is?" It goes through. It says, "Yep, I know the IP address is 5.6.7.8." Here you go, and it passes it back to the user's computer. The user's computer says, cool, now I've got this IP address. I'm gonna head out to the internet and I'm gonna find the servers which serve that address and it'll go straight to the servers and that essentially is the website. So it's basically, again, just reaching out for information says, hey, I have this information about a system. I know that I can find it at this human readable domain, www.google.com, internet, uh, authoritative name servers or name servers, please give me the IP address that that this data actually uh, resides. And once I get that back, my computer will say, it's cool, I've got the address. Now I can go to my destination and it goes out to the destination to get that information. Um, so that's, that's again, very high level how DNS works. Um, a very simple overview. Does anyone have any questions about that? So next thing, so I talked about you having to set up this mapping. Um, I talked about uh, there's, there's a mapping that needs to be set up. Um, and these are done through something called DNS records. And they look like this, and this is gonna be a little confusing. I'm gonna show you this a little, uh, kind of real time in a second. So uh, it's important to know the types of records that you that you want, hold on, so it doesn't, it still go out to your ISP, even knowing the address. I don't, it does not always, it does not always go out to your ISP um, if your computer knows the address. I'm actually gonna show you some ways, there are some cool things you can do um, locally when you when you wanna spoof this, when you wanna stop this from happening. If your computer knows the address, um, it will not, well, not it will not, but it, it probably won't go out and grab it. And again, there are ways where you can, if you want to set your, if you wanna set your own DNS, um, you can you can do that and you can do some custom things um, for that to happen. So again, your, your, your DNS does some local stuff um, to make sure it doesn't always have to go out and make that request. Cause that would make all your requests pretty slow. Um, and again, there are ways that you can manipulate that to do some things that you wanna do. We're gonna go over that. But A records, um, I think it is important. I didn't put, there are way more, there are, there are not way more, but there are more types of DNS records than this. Um, but these are some common ones that I think you should be familiar with. Again, there are more than this, um, but these are ones that you may have to uh, manage on a daily basis. But an A record, this is your, this is what I would consider the standard record. Your, your standard record is your A record, which is a host record. And this is basically a, a host name um, link to an IPv4 address. So this, uh, so the example I have here is google.com and it goes to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. This is not, this is not true. And I'll show you what, what it actually goes to, the A record for google.com, what it actually goes to, but this is kind of what the mapping is. So this is this is a record that you would set up. If I if I owned Google.com, I would go in and I would um, I would type in, you know, hey, whenever someone goes to Google.com, we need to go to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Now, it's something that's important to note here is that for records, um, 
they work for your domain, but they also work for subdomains. So uh, www.google.com is actually different from google.com, and I can send that to a different IP address. So I could send www.google.com over to 8.8.8.9 if I'd like to, or any subdomain. It could be aaron.google.com or, or win.google.com, and I could choose where to send that. Um, usually, usually most people send those to the same place. It's likely you'll send that to the same place, um, but you, you do have that option. And these are all set with A records. Um, and again, IPv4. So th in this format, the four octets um, here, and this could be, again, th each of these could have three um, three numbers in them if, if, if yeah, if it was set that way, um, but it'll be a number that looks like this. The next one is these quadruple A records. So these are the same type of host records, but they're using IPv6 and so, what IPv6 is is I think I think these uh, I think regular A records IPv4 I believe is are 32 bits so that allows a certain amount of IP addresses and we'll look up the exact number um, but basically what happens with IP addresses you know as the internet has boomed as everyone is consuming them um, that and you, you realize that they all have to be unique um, but we're we're running out of them um, and so what happens is just like we did with phone numbers we you know we had seven digit phone numbers in the United States and you know once we started to consume them all we needed to we needed a way to get more phone numbers so we added in area codes which meant we could have you know the same seven digit number you know in different regions with different area codes and that you know exponentially increased the amount of phone numbers we could have IPv6, on the other hand, is I think 128 bit. And this allows for a massive amount more IP addresses to be uh, spread around. Um, we, we, we won't use these up in our lifetime at all. We, we, we won't use these up in, for a very long time. So there are tons of IP addresses in here. Um, I will look up the number for that as well. Um, but that's the difference between the A record and the quadruple A record here. Um, C name, canonical name. These are pretty important. And maybe I can show you the canonical name that I actually, this is what I use to send uh, my traffic to the S3 bucket that I'm using. But this is a way for you to send. Uh, this is an alias record. So instead of, you know, this stuff has to go to an IP address. That's how your computer knows how to make it work. But you can use a canonical name to send, you know, a host name to another host name, basically. And so when we go to www.google.com, I can set it to go to public.02.fun.com. And then my computer would still have to go through and do another DNS check uh, to figure out what that is. But it's an alias name. Um, it's it's used a lot of times for services when you uh, when this is all that all that they provide you. There's a there's a few use cases where canonical names are very important. Um, a lot of hosting providers use these C names uh, to be able to give you access to certain things and be able to do dynamic IP addresses on the back end. But yeah, that's what a, that's what a C name is. And so when you see that, think that it's pointed at another host name. MX uh, MX record is a mail exchange record. So this is this is a record that's used uh, when sending mail. And so you can have a bunch of these in your uh, domain. I'll actually show you this. If you've ever set up Google apps for business or something like that, um, you've probably seen this or if you've ever set up um, what's it called? Uh, what's the Microsoft 365 for a custom domain? Um, you may have seen this, but these are records that um, when you attempt to you know, send mail um, or someone attempts to, send, attempts to send you mail that it can grab that points it at the proper mail servers. Um, so these are different from the rest, from everything else. And the last one um, that we're gonna talk about, but again, not the last, not the last record. There are some, there are SOA records, there, there are text records, there, there are a few other records here, um, but I'm gonna stick with just these for now. I don't wanna overwhelm you. But the last one is name server records. So we talked about that place that houses, one of the places that houses the, the data um, uh, in that mapping list you set. So, um, so you can set which servers, you know, are the, are the kind of the authority for, your site so google.com going to 8.8.8.8 i can set up my own custom name servers uh to be kind of the source of truth here these are not the authoritative name servers um those are a set of name servers that are set outside of all of this but um the name servers are where um you can set to be your the place that houses your dns information for your domain 
Um, and that's all it is for DNS records, uh, for the actual records themselves. We're about to go through and use some, learn some Linux tools to be able to kind of look these things up and to be able to, you know, kind of see how it works um, and kind of get this information. We'll have the computer do this translation for us and we'll get some IP addresses for some sites and things like that. Um, and I'll show you some cool tools on how you can manipulate some things locally to kind of manipulate DNS. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about why that might be important. All right, so let's check out the chat. Long with DNS is when you're working with a web developer that doesn't understand DNS but knows thing needs to be said. Class DNS ends up hosting it. Absolutely. Um, because of the way DNS works, um, a lot of people know a lot of people know a little bit about it, and that makes things tough. Um, because again, like I said, very high level DNS is pretty simple. At, at, at face value, DNS is very simple. It's just a translation from a human readable name to a number, basically. Um, but there's a lot that goes in with that. There's a lot of logic. Uh, there's a lot of logic about like like in and trying to figure out how to host things properly and make sure people are getting the information, like make sure their computers are getting the right information about where things lie, where things live. Um, and, and, you know, managing DNS can be a big struggle. And we're gonna learn a lot about that tonight, but we're also, again, we're gonna get hands-on again with DNS. Once we get into the um, cloud computing section, we're gonna be doing a lot of hands-on stuff with, with Route 53, which is Amazon Web Services a DNS um, a service. Um, and so we'll be checking out stuff with that. All right. Oh, no, 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 keep, keep keep the chat going whatever whatever comes up whatever spins off of the discussion um absolutely you know keep the chat going for sure blue cam i see you like it awesome awesome sherm yeah I'm, I'm glad you're here i'm glad you're checking it out um yeah, we're gonna be doing, right now we're doing DevOps. The, the goal in the future is to do a few different types of boot camps. I'm actually working with um, a few people actually. Uh, we might get some other, I've, I've had some interest from some other instructors who maybe wanna do the programming piece, like a pure programming boot camp, and I'll do probably a, a pure Linux boot camp, pure uh, cloud computing boot camp. So we'll have some other stuff on here, but that's more to follow. This is kind of the, uh, this is kind of the pilot boot camp to see how people like it, to see what we can do to make it, uh, make it a lot better. So if anyone's interested, and uh, if you think you would like to teach, you know what you know, um, reach out to me. You know, again, this is this is for fun. This is for people to, you know, be able to be able to spread the information. You know, this is it's scalable. So reach out to me if you're interested in anything like that. Looking for ways to to kind of make this a little bit bigger than it is. Um, but cool. So we learned a bit a little bit about DNS, uh, very high level. We learned a bit a little bit about DNS records. You know, the things that you can set up to set up those mappings. Um, so let's let's talk about some of the Linux tools that we can use to interact with DNS and to look up DNS information uh, here. So we got a few tools. Uh, we have Dig, which is the one that I would recommend. I don't know what the current um, recommended tool is. I recommend Dig. Um, another one is NS Lookup. They both do similar things, um, passing in different flags, but they, they both, both the tools are different things. And we'll look at the man pages for both. Um, who is, um, who has, who is, is a DNS lookup tool. This will give you a little bit of different information. Um, usually you would use this to find out, you can actually find out who hosts and owns, um, a certain website. If it's not private, you don't, you can make these things private, but, uh, you can use who is, if there's a, you know, if someone already, if I really want to mastermind with an I, so I ha this is called mastermind with no I because there was no the domain mastermind wasn't available. But if I wanted to, I could look up who owned it. Um, and I can reach out to them. Uh, usually their number will be on their email address and I can offer to buy it from them or we could make a, we can make a deal. Um, so sometimes that who is information is available and you can use who is to find out information about a site. Um, you can get name servers and things like that from who is, um, and then you can use things like we're going to, I'm going to show you how you can use your Etsy host file to, uh, to mock your DNS or to make changes to your local DNS. Um, same thing for the resolve.com. So resolve.conf is going to allow you to uh, set an actual uh, a separate server like that you want to use for DNS resolution. Um, so in the in this chart here, um, you know, we said, hey, it's going to go out to this ISP and so get information from that. You can actually circumvent that 
with the resolve.conf if you'd like um and the etsy host will be for individual so instead of hitting a new server it'll be for individual addresses so i could point locally i could point mastermind.io to google.com or wherever i wanted to go if i knew the ip address um you can use this a lot of times if you're doing some uh local development or maybe you don't own the domain yet and you've pushed out your code somewhere and you want to be able to see it on the server um by name you can set up uh your host file to do some things like that and i can show you um i can show you that but yeah who is is absolutely worthless now um since they're not enforced uh almost they're almost always private now as well uh they used to be a lot more i used to use who is pretty heavily but yes it, it is relatively worthless now and i can almost guarantee you everything we hit using who is in a second is going to be worthless so let's go ahead and use some of these tools really quick all right let's move this down a screen awesome so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the man page for dig um oh yeah for, man i haven't used mx toolbox thanks see I, I i love you guys like mx toolbox was the very first job that i worked at i actually worked at a web hosting company so i used to um i used to do deal with DNS a lot like I used to deal with this stuff all the time and MX toolbox was absolutely a great tool for that We're, we're definitely gonna go to that um, Shortly right after this. Um, so this is a it's a website you can use to do these same uh, Lookups if you'd like but cool DNS um, Is a dig is a DNS lookup utility and it's got a bunch of options here It's a flexible tool for interrogating DNS name servers And so you can perform these DNS lookups in the same way that your browser would do it um, and get quick information um, So that's what you you usually do with dig so you dig uh at server uh server name type and i'll show you how to use that really fast so very simple um it's an easy tool to use if you want to if you want to find out the ip address um for a website you can just do dig and let's just go yahoo.com i'll do we'll do google after that but so um, this is going by default with no other flags. Um, you can do it just like this, dig the name of the website or domain that you would like. Um, and it's gonna deliver you back. I believe it's gonna deliver you back. We talk about those different records. It's only gonna give back to you the A record for this um, with no other flags. I, I'm pretty sure that's what it'll give you. So we'll hit enter here and it'll give you a bunch of information up here. Um, it lets you know a lot about the header, a lot about the query. Um, it lets you know kind of where it, like how it got it. We'll talk about UDP later. Um, but you can see here, it gave us a bunch of A records, a bunch of IP addresses for yahoo.com. Um, and so we can do it again for google.com. And so Google only gives us one, but I'm gonna copy this real quick. This probably won't work. They probably put in some, they probably put in some uh, networking logic to allow this not to work. But no, you see here how I actually typed in the IP address and Chrome actually, oh, it's Firefox actually. Firefox actually uh, redirected it to, well, not redirected it, it, it pasted in google.com. It knew that was the server that we're going to and it pasted it in. So, you know, so I've got, we were able to grab the IP address of Google and paste it in um, because a browser knows how to use this. And so, you can use this for, I mean, again, for any website to find out the IP address. Um, and so it's pretty handy. What you can also do is you can grab those different records. So we talked about, let's look back at different records. I can grab specifically each of these records. And let's look at, I think I can do, I think, I think there's easy, I think there's a shortcut for this, but I think I can add four A's and it will give me, you know, the, IPv6 um, records for yahoo.com or let's do google.com since Yahoo always has so many, a little bit easier to read. And now this is the IPv6 version and I'm not sure that this will work via browser, but let's see. Let's... Ah, it, it didn't, it just Googled it for me. Um, so it didn't work right. Um, but I think, I think there may be ways you can enable that in your browser to be able to take IPv6, maybe something I have to do locally, but either way, um, you saw that I passed in, you know, which record that I wanted and it gave me that. So I can do, um, what else do we have here? We had C name, so canonical name. We'll see if, we'll see if this has any, it might not have a canonical name, which it doesn't. So you, it'll still give it back to you, but it lets us know that we don't have anything. I'm gonna do mastermind.io because mastermind definitely has 
Uh, Mastermind definitely has one because that is what I use since it's not running on the server. What? Is it, did I do this wrong? Master. Oh, okay, all right, so this is only for, uh, I guess it's only for WWW, I guess. Huh, I need to check that out, actually. That seems like I messed something up. Uh, but yeah, so C name, remember, this is an alias name. So it's pointed at another host name, basically. Um, yeah, it's pointed at another host name, um, not an IP address. So pretty interesting. Most websites are probably not gonna have this. Uh, most websites you commonly go to probably will not have a C name. Um, yeah, probably won't have a C name. Cool. Um, what else do we have? What else can we look for? Uh, MX and in name servers. Cool. So let's look at MX records for Google. Um, and so it has, you know, so it has a few here. Um, it's important to note for MX records, you'll have multiple records for it to try. Um, and they, they're, they're set by priority. So lowest number is the priority. So you can see here of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So it'll try in that order. It'll it'll check to see if those things, um, it, when it's trying to send mail, if those things are active, if it can uh, use those to send. Um, and I mean, I think usually it'll hit the first one, but in case it's unavailable, um, you have some other options uh, for you here and it sets the priority for that. Um, Oh yes, yes, you are right. The thank you, and this is these are a lot. There's a lot of little caveats to to DNS. Um, the reason why Mastermind.io is not a C name is because the root domain cannot be a C name. I think there are ways. I think there are ways to do this now. I I think I, I saw an article. I didn't read through it. I've never tried it. I've never seen it. But I saw an article that that hinted that it might be possible but i don't know a way to do it um and so that's why that's not said that way but i do have um i think i actually have some a redirect record that should push you to www but i'm not sure i i've got a lot of work to do to the site actually um cool uh let's see and then the last one we have are the the ns records so the name server records and we can ask for those records and we can see the, the the records that they've set for their name server. So again, these are, again, these are just simple mappings that you set and actually let's go, let's hop into, maybe I'll hop into my Google domains. Hopefully there's not something in here that uh, any personal information you guys can take, but it'll be fine. Like, let's see my domains. Actually, I don't think I host my domain out of this yeah it's not in mastermind it's actually in my personal one hold on, i can show you kind of what a dns dashboard looks like um one second let me get to it and maybe maybe it'll help my domains All right, there we go, DNS, and let's change this to desktop view. Make this a little bit larger, and you can dig all this information, but you'll just have a dashboard uh, like this, um, and you can, you know, edit. Um, you can edit and you just plug it in, so if you're trying to do like mail, Google will give you these things. Um, I'll try to skip over, well, yeah. I just have some C names set up in here for some other ways to get to the site that I'm working on. But yeah, that's what a that's what a DNS dashboard looks like. Um, this is I probably have might have to switch this text record out now, but um, it'll be fine. I trust you all. There's only a couple of people watching this, but I'll, I'll swap it out. Um, I don't I don't think anyone would try to uh, inflate my Google Analytics numbers, but that actually might be a good thing. So if you are going to steal something, steal that. Um, but yeah, it's just like this. It's just a dashboard simple. You can plug it in um, and that sets your records for you um, You may also have to run for, I, I highly doubt you have to run your own DNS server um, But let's hop back into the VM um, But there are uh, there are uh, there's something called a bind server and actually you you saw when I did dig uh, man dig yeah, it's, it says using by nine right at the top. Um, so you might have to set up a bind server. So you might have to manually manage a, um, you might have to manually manage uh, what are called DNS zones. Um, 
in in bind i i i doubt it uh there are a lot of services that'll do this for you now uh pretty easily but yeah you may have to manage dns manually i had to do it, it it's it's not terrible um but yeah, you, these these records are important. You can see why these records would be important. You know, people, you know, especially if you have a site that, you know, makes money, um, is revenue generating, you know, you need people to be able to get to the things that you want them to get to. You know, when they type in www.yoursite.com, they need to go where they need to go. Um, and DNS causes a lot of issues. DNS also takes time to propagate. So propagation means uh, that when you make a change to DNS, um, it's gotta, that information has to spread uh, throughout the world, really. It has to spread to all the authoritative name servers. That, that information takes time to update. Um, and DNS records actually have something called a time to kill um, on, on these requests. Um, so there's a there's a period of time that they stay active for. So if you set a high time, a time not time to kill, time to live. I don't know why I said time to kill, um, but time to live. Um, and so you, if you set a high time to live, that means that um, less there will be less check ins to to the server that you set these things up to your name to your name servers but that means if you need to make changes to them that it will take uh th those changes will be active until that time to live is up um so if i so it could be that if i tried to make a change to you know mastermind.io right now a dns change it could be depending on what my time to live is set at it could be days uh before changes are seen around the world. Um, some servers will get those updates and some people who access from certain places in the country who actually hit those name servers would actually see those updates. And there are some like DNS uh, uh, propagation checkers like around the world. So if you ever have to make a change to DNS and you're not sure how long it's gonna take, you can type in like uh, google.com and it'll search and it'll let you know what IP address or what C name or whatever comes back for each of these spots. And so you know what to look for. You know that, hey, I just put in this brand new IP address that's 8.8.8.8. And you can see where around the world it's propagated and that people are actually getting the right information. So it's it's super problematic. That's why DNS is also important. You know, you can't just make, you usually can't just make really quick updates to it. Uh, there's usually a time factor involved in it. So you wanna get things right when you are messing around with DNS. All right. Um, we talked about some other tools on here. So NS lookup is similar. I don't really use NS lookup too much anymore. Again, you can query the internet name servers interactively. Um, it's got some options here, but we'll show you what the output looks like. And you'll get some, you'll get the IP address here for google.com, you know, it's a little less, um, and you can pass in some extra things, but I, again, I would, I would probably use dig, but NS lookup works fine. Um, what else do we have? And we had who is, so let's do who is uh, google.com. Oh, I don't even have it. So let me install it. You know, if you all see me type in, uh, someone asked me about this actually. Um, sometimes when you try to get a pack, when you try to use a package that doesn't exist, it tells you how to go ahead and install it. And it says apt install who is. Um, apt is an alias for apt get. Um, this is kind of old old school or older school. Uh, they're the same thing. And I type it in by habit. You do not have to type in the dash get. Um, it is, again, it's just a, it's, muscle memory at this point. Um, so don't, if you ever see me do that, don't sweat it. Maybe I'll just, I'll pull it off right now. Maybe I'll get into the habit of not doing it to confuse people. Is, oh, is it not? Um, is it, is it the other way around? I'm pretty sure one's an alias for the other. What is it then? Definitely let me know what it is. If it is not. App is the new version. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, are you sure? Similar parameters, but they're two separate. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Um, mm, let me see. Um, okay. Hmm. I thought they were. I definitely thought they were aliases for each other. Learn to the new every day. Um, do you know? Do you know what? Um, 
what's different about them. I, I, I would like to know what's different about them, if you know offhand. If not, I can, I can always look it up. Um, but yeah, you learn something new every day. Thank you. Um, so I installed who is, and let's clear the screen. And let's go with who is google.com. So I get a lot of information here. Um, so you can see here, I get the name servers, um, but I also get information, you know, about the registrar, you know, who the registrar for this domain is, when it expires. So if you're, if you are, let's say, let's say we were, uh, let's say you're starting up like a cannabis company and, you know, you found the great domain, but people bought those up a while ago and they were kind of holding on to them to try to sell to make a bunch of money. And you, you, you know, you want to see when that expires, you know, you can wait it out. Um, and once it expires, you know, it, it, it goes back into the pool and you can usually buy it. Um, you can usually buy it for a decent price. So you can you can check and see when a domain is gonna expire. It doesn't mean the person isn't gonna renew, but you can get that information from this. Again, you can see who the registrar is. Um, and that's the company that this domain, who owns this domain and who this domain was purchased from. Um, domains can be transferred, you know, to different registrars. Um, but again, sometimes you can get information about who owns it. I actually don't know if Mastermind is public or not. But yeah, you can see that what my name servers are, um, but it looks like I have things set to private, I guess, by default. Um, but you can see when I bought it um, and you can see when it expires. So I won't let it expire. It is on auto renew. Um, I'll probably pay for a lot longer now. Um, I always pay for a domain just for one year up front um, because there are many times I own lots of domains and you don't know if you're going to use them, um, but you can go ahead and update that anytime you want. Uh, let's see. Do we have an answer for the app stuff? Aptitude is another. I'm confused. Ha, huh, yes. Yes. Uh, was it Dunix? I get, I used to get Aptitude and Apt confused and Apt get confused all the time. Um, and it's because someone said it to me when I was first learning Linux and they were wrong and I held on to that for years. Um, app version and app get uh, version output. The same version, but AppGit has more output. <laughs> hmm, okay. All right, interesting. That is that is good to know, though. Um, and Apt is newer, so I'll switch over to Apt. Or, like, like because there's not an alias, I will just make AppGit a, uh, a symlink to Apt. So even if I type it in wrong, I still am using the newer thing. Hacky, you probably shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it because this is a VM, and I'm excited about it. Um, cool. So we did who is, yeah, now let's do Etsy hosts. So we talked about being able to manipulate your local DNS. So, um, there's a file and again, we're going to use Vim for this, um, Etsy host file, every computer, every Linux computer has one. And when you open it up, you will see some options in here. And we looked at this when we talked about local hosts before. Um, but we talk about the name, uh, the, 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 the IP address 127.0.0.1, meaning uh, home, meaning this is the IP address to reference your local computer, the computer that you're currently on. This is always the address to reference that computer um, when you're on it, only when you're on it, to reference it from itself. Um, and it's it's aliased to local, to local host, or it's the DNS address, local the the DNA, the domain name localhost is uh is mapped back to 127.0.0.1 this here the second line is your ipv6 for uh localhost so um so this is this colon colon one is the ipv the ipv6 equivalent to this one up top so these are kind of the same thing ipv4 ipv6 um, and then we've got this 127.0.1.1 address, which is a machine address that gets added um, by default on this distribution. It may not be set on your distribution, but it is linked to the machine name um, to my local domain. Um, and I can use these to reference that IP address as well. But what I can do is I can also do, um, let me show you, let's, let's, let's do something really quick. Let's get out of here. Let me, and I'm thinking about this on, off the top of the dome, so hopefully this works. Um, sudo apt install, I might already install Nginx on here, but I'm gonna install a web server on here really quick and sudo, whoops, what is it? Um, I'm old school or service, that was done. Service, 
nginx start. And so, okay, so nginx is just a web server. So now my, my computer's serving a website um, on, should be on port 80. So if I go to localhost, I can see here, um, I get this information back because my computer is serving this information. So again, this is my home address. So because I'm serving over port 80, we'll talk about HTTP shortly, but uh, my web browser, is it, it tries to reach out to my computer uh, over the HTTP protocol um, on port 80, um, and it gets this information back. So this is running on my computer. Um, but what I can do is I can point, so sudo, them that se host file i can use this to redirect what my computer thinks the ip address is for a domain and so we can just do 127.0.0.1 and i can do google.com and i can also do www.google.com um so now when i go to google.com or www.google.com it's going to translate that address also to 127.0.0.1 i could also put those on that line on this line i might have to put those on this line i can't remember we're gonna try this out and see yeah you, you can definitely throw them in the uh you can definitely throw them in the same row i want but i'm interested to see if this works now actually so now if i go here and i go to google.com I might have to private browse or throw them in the same line. Unable to connect. Um, oh, oh, so Google automatically redirects to HTTPS. There we go. So I had to pull off the S uh, because this is run only running. My Nginx is only listening over port 80 and not over the secured port. And that works. Um, I can also do someone mentioned ping. Good job. You can do ping google.com, which will give me the IP address. And you can see here it is uh, getting results from localhost. So um, so now, you know, I've redirected what my computer, I've been able to manipulate what my computer thinks the IP address for google.com is. And I am, I need Google. I should probably should have did that for like Yahoo or something. Um, so let me go ahead and return that to what it's supposed to be. so that I can actually Google things now. And so you can always ping, and now you can see here, if I ping, I'm getting a different address. So that is all good to go. Um, and I'll get out of the private browser, and Google should still work fine for me. I'll Google something, cool. Yeah, so that's how you can use, um, you can use this to, to do that. So when you, another reason you might wanna use this is, if I went and, and purchased a server off of um, off of a website, um, maybe I did something on uh, on on uh, what's it called, Linode, or off of uh, DigitalOcean. Um, and let's say I, I purchased a server and I'm working on an application and I've, I'm building out that application and. The way I have it set up, I want to see it. Uh, like I've put it out on the server, and I want to see it kind of working. But you know, I haven't purchased the domain name yet. Um, but I, I know I'm going to purchase the domain name. Um, but I kind of want to check it out on the server without typing in the IP address. Um, you could put in, you know, any whatever your domain name you want it to be is. As long as the IP address is valid, you can put in whatever domain name you want. And when you type that into the address bar, or you ping it, or you try to hit it from any protocol, it will go to where you want it to go. Again, it will. It will. It, it will change the local DNS for that address. It won't reach out to the internet to get the proper address. So you can use that to, you can use that to, uh, to manage kind of your own local DNS. Um, so let's also take a look at the resolve.com. And I haven't messed with. So if you are going along with this with me, do not accidentally make changes to this file. Um, this is, this is, uh, you can actually, uh, change where your name servers are. Um, you can change kind of how your DNS um, acts. Don't like definitely don't mess with this now. Um, but you can use this for a lot of different things. Um, you can use this for testing DNS servers. You can test. You can use this to test um, DNS settings if you're running your own DNS servers. Um, but this is just another tool that you have available to you um, to do that. And so this isn't for. This is setting your DNS resolver, the location of your DNS resolver. This DNS resolver is um, is actually a local DNS resolver, so it checks there first. This is an address for something local, um, and it's actually running 
uh, it's, it's, it's a it's a process that's running, um, but you could change that. You could put you could point that out to something else. Some people change this to like Google's DNS resolver, which you saw me using that eight dot eight dot eight dot eight address. Um, I believe that is Google's DNS resolver uh, that you can you know use to kind of test DNS as well. So you can point it at that. Um, but don't mess with this file right now. Um, it just know that it is something that you can use, uh, another tool that you can use to uh, manage DNS and to do testing of DNS um, in, in Linux. And that's all we're gonna say about that. So what time is it? Cool, coming up on nine. All right, so Linux DNS tools. Um, so now let's start going over some of the protocols. Uh, we talked about a lot of these things. Um, we briefly mentioned a lot of these things in the OSI model, but let's talk about these because these are very important. Um, one, it's important to know that protocols are kind of just a, a, a set of rules for how to do something. Um, and so these protocols are just a set of rules for transmitting data. Um, and so they're, they're all kind of, they all kind of manage different things. Um, and the first one, the main one we're gonna talk about is HTTP. And this is how you, uh, this is how data gets transmitted over the internet um, or te how text gets transmitted over the internet. Um, this is, you know, the, the essentially the protocol you're using when you hit a website, but it's a, it's a web communication uh, protocol for sending and receiving text-based messages. Uh, it stands for hypertext transfer protocol, and there should be a space in between this, um, but it is for uh, sending over text. Uh, it does not send videos. Um, a lot of people are confused about that. Uh, HTTP does not uh, transmit videos. Um, but it runs over port 80 by default. It is important that you remember that HTTP is run over port 80 by default. Um, and so your your web browser knows to check that port. Uh, that's the port that it's attempting to connect to these uh, servers over. Um, and so uh, whenever you see, so you see up here at the top, you see HTTPS, we're gonna talk about that, but um, it, that protocol can be specified uh, by HTTP uh, colon slash slash. And then the address, that, that is how you're, you're that that will tell your computer um you know which port and which protocol to access over important to know um but that is not the one that you're probably usually using you're probably usually using https um and so this is the same thing this is hypertext transfer protocol secure and so um you know we're all about security we're all about keeping things safe and uh this is the whoops that should be https here um, and that is what all of these websites are. So you see the little lock up here. You usually see a lock in your browser, but um, the HTTPS at the beginning is that protocol. It's hypertext uh, transfer protocol secure. And it is secure. Um, it is secure because, let's go back to, where are we at? Um, well, not as secure as, but it is, it, well, it is secure because it, it, the data transfer that's transferred between the server and the computer is encrypted. That's how it makes sure that, uh, that that's how it's secure. Um, it, it encrypts that data, um, during transfer. Um, and when it gets to the server, it decrypts that data and same thing, it passes it back and forth and it's encrypted while it's transferring. The default port for that is uh, 443. Um, and encryption is enabled via SSL and TLS. Um, I, I like how people are already calling it out. Um, SSL is dead. Um, it's deprecated, but um, still want to, it is a term you're gonna see. It is a term you're gonna need to be familiar with. A lot of people, when they're talking about TLS, are going to be, uh, are gonna say SSL. People are still gonna say SSL for sure. So I want you to know what SSL and TLS is, um, but that's how it is encrypted. It is encrypted via, via SSL and TLS. Um, yeah, and let's, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So SSL and TLS is very, very, very important uh, pieces of the internet. Um, this is how, you know, we're transferring lots of data. This is how you don't get, uh, this is how companies do their best to keep you safe um, on the internet and keep the data that you're uh, transmitting safe. There are other ways to do this. This is not the, this is not a foolproof way to kind of do this stuff, but it is a way to keep your information secure. Um, so SSL stands for secure socket layer. And again, I, I would, I would get familiar with the term just because you will hear SSL when people are 
talking about TLS, um, I thought about just throwing TLS in here, but you will come across SSL and I don't want you to be confused. Um, TLS stands for transport layer security. Um, SSL is deprecated. I, I want to say the latest version was deprecated in 2015, I believe. Um, and TLS kind of rises. It's kind of taken its place. Um, they're both, they're both kind of, um, yeah, they're both this cryptographic, um, encryption, uh, protocols. They're, they're different protocols. Um, and they both use certificates. Um, they both use certificates to, to do this. Uh, these certificates, uh, basically have, uh, they have basically an encryption key and a key to kind of un unlocks that, um, one kind of goes out to the browser, um, and one stays on the servers to be able to encrypt and decrypt, uh, the communication. Um, but the certificates, uh, they're not dependent on protocol. Um, they are, the certificates are basically used. A lot of people will say SSL certificate there. There's not a different SSL certificate and TLS certificate. There is a cer certificate that can be used with SSL sell um and tls um but yeah these certificates are pretty important maybe i can show you how to generate one um i can show you how to generate an ssl tls certificate um again tls is a, is more secure um now it's, it's taking it's taking the place of ssl but people will people will still call that uh SSL, hundred percent. Yep, it, like I, I one thousand percent promise you, you will. People will refer to it as SSL. I catch myself doing it uh, pretty often, um, just because that's what I spend so much time uh, working on and calling it. But it is not a thing anymore, which is pretty interesting. All right, so pretty important. Um, actually, let's talk a little bit more about uh, SSL. Actually, so you used to have to go and buy um ssl certificates from um like people like digicert and symantec and they used to cost a good bit of money and they still do i think i think you can still buy see they even call them ssl certificates um because that is what uh that's what they that's what they do actually let's check this link um yeah so they still call them ssl certificates um on both of them, I'm gonna see semantic, SSL. Are they still a thing when they get purchased? Yeah, you click on it, you always call it SSL. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. Um, but yeah, they, they still call them, they still call them this, um, but the pro, so these certificates get generated, but the protocol is actually set on your web server. You actually set the protocol in the web server. So the certificate doesn't really care uh, which protocol and okay, Symantec got smart and put SSL TLS um, on here. It looks like this just still says buy an SSL certificate. Um, but yeah, you don't have to buy these anymore. Um, there are tools that allow you to do this for free. Um, Amazon will give you one for free. Um, I think you may have to purchase your domain through them. Um, but check out something called, um, uh, let's encrypt. They kind of changed the game, um, and allow you to have free SSL, free automated SSL and open source, uh, um, certificates, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I've used this a lot. Most, a lot of people are using this nowadays. Um, but yeah, there, there are ways you don't really have to go in and buy these anymore. You used to have to do, uh, it was actually used to be a pretty lengthy process. You would basically say, your company would say, all right, we need an SSL certificate. Um, so what you would have to do is you would go to DigiCert or you would go to Symantec and you would say, all right, I want a cert. Um, and you can see how these are expensive. Um, and you say, I want a cert. And they say, cool, enter this information. And then you enter in the information like name and like company name and stuff like that. and they would, um, then they would, they would usually generate it for you, but they would generate something called uh, a, a, a CSR, which I think is a certificate signing request. Um, and you would take that and you would, um, you would, you would run this and it would, it would give it to you. And then you could submit that, you could submit that CSR to them. Um, and then they go ahead and they generate, um, certificates based on that CSR. They'd give you a few files. Uh, usually you will need two. There are times when you need three um, for some systems, but you would get, um, you get basically a public key and a private key kind of uh, file. You would get, you would get these two things. One would, one would stay uh, on the web server. Um, and then you would get one that would basically um, go out to the web that people will be able to see via their browser. Um, and so you can see here, I can actually see um, 
more information about the certificate. I can actually view the certificate. This is a this is a public certificate that I um, that you can see. I, can, I think I can download it. Um, I can click in here and I can actually see the certificate. Um, but there's one on the server uh, that knows that these kind of fit together, um, and it uses that. It when the request comes in, it uh, it goes ahead and it checks against the one that's on the server and it says, "Hey, do these match up? They match up. If they match up, uh, we're good. We can go ahead and use. We can use that information to. We can use that key to decrypt the data that comes through. The encrypted data that comes through." Um, and you would get both of those and you would have to go ahead and install those uh, in, in your web server. You have to install those in the Nginx or Apache or IIS. Um, and that's how you have to do that. And then every so often uh, you would it would renew. So one or two years and you have to go in and you have to replace those files. Um, you no longer have to do that with Let's Encrypt. You can automate that that, that process. Um, you know, you can have it updated a lot more than a year. I think I think. You can have it updated as few. Like, I mean, you can do it every day if you want, um, but you, you know, you can do it on a monthly basis or whatever. Um, you can do it in an automated fashion. Um, it's a pretty cool tool to use. Um, a little weird to approach if this is your first time diving into SSL certificates. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to learn how to deploy them first before using this. You can make your, you can generate your own SSL TLS certificates uh, locally. Um, it's, it's pretty simple to do. Uh, the problem is those are called self-signed certificates. Um, and the problem is, although that they, they do work for encrypting or and decrypting data, they, they're not trusted by any authority. So you will, if you use a self-signed certificate, you will not get this green connection. You'll probably actually get an error. Um, you actually probably get an error from, from the web browser that says, Hey, we don't like, this is not a trusted certificate. No chain came with this. Like, like we don't know, we don't know what this is. You signed it, but you self signed it. Like we can't trust that. Um, and it'll give you some errors, but you can use that for testing purposes. You can use that for a lot of different things. Um, it does, it, it does work. Um, uh, but again, it's not trusted by anybody. So, um, yeah, so you so you you'll want to either use a service like Let's Encrypt or Amazon's uh, was it ACM, which is their certificate manager, um, or purchase one if you have to. I wouldn't purchase one. There are a lot of ways around it um, for that. But cool. Um, and again, whenever you think SSL TLS, just think about the little lock up here. Think HTTPS. Think about the little lock and just know that that means the data is encrypted um, and while it transfers. All right, the next protocol we're gonna talk about is FTP. Um, I debated not putting FTP in here as well. I haven't used FTP in a long time actually, but FTP is file transfer protocol. And from, to my surprise, tons of people still use this to manage uh, data on their web servers. It is, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Um, I, I prefer some other methods, um, but I understand why people love this. Um, so this file, file, file transfer protocol, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's funny that you say SFTP, um, and I'm assuming that you mean SFTP and not FTPS, which is a little confusing. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second too, or we'll talk about it after we get to SSH, but um, it stands for file transfer protocol, and this is how you get files from uh, from your local, if you're trying to get some files from your local computer up to a server or really any any machine to another machine, you can use the file transfer protocol to do so. Um, I'm pretty sure it runs over port 21. It might be over port 23. I didn't look this up. I was trying to just go off of memory. Um, let's actually look that up to make sure. I don't want to give you false information. Again, because I haven't done this in so long. FTP port. Cool, got it right. Glad I remembered that, but it runs over port 21. Um, and so we've learned, uh, we've only learned three ports so far, I think. We learned, again, the port for HTTP, which is important to remember, which is port 80, HTTPS, which is port 443, and we've learned so far FTP, which is port 21. Very important to, I think, you don't need to remember FTP port, but you definitely need to remember the other two. Um, port numbers will come up a fair amount, um, and, and have, knowing them offhand will help a lot. Um, cool. So again, it's used to transfer files, uh, from local machine to remote server. Um, and we'll check out, maybe I'll download it. Um, you can do, you can do FTP from the command line. Um, but a lot of people like it. Um, and I completely forgot you could do this. Um, you can use an uh, FTP program. Um, usually people like the, 
the GUI interface of FTP programs. Um, one of the biggest ones is FileZilla. Um, and so maybe I'll download FileZilla really quick. Let's see if we can take a look at it. When, even though I don't have a, I don't actually have a server to, uh, to connect to, maybe I'll set one up. But I don't want to connect to you, but FileZilla is basically a, a window that'll open that'll allow you to basically plug in, you know, the username and the password and the host name of a server, and it'll connect over port 21 over, you know, the FTP protocol, and it'll basically give you two file browsers. It'll give you your local files and the, the file system on the server, and you can basically drag and drop and move files uh, very easily from one place to another. Um, there are, again, like I said, I think there are better ways to transfer files. And did that open up? I should click in. I'm not gonna install that right now. Um, but if you wanna check out FileZilla, I'll copy this. You can check out FileZilla if you like. Um, it is multi-platform open source. Well, I don't know if it's open source, but it is multi-platform. Uh, I'm not 100% sure it's open source. But again, you can use that to get files to your to your to your server. Um, I know a lot of web developers who are running their own systems use FTP to to be able to do that. Um, it is so it is not the same as WinSCP, but I believe WinSCP has FTP functionality. Uh, actually, maybe it is the same because I actually think FileZilla has SCP functionality as well. So yes, I will say that it is. Uh, I will say that it is the same. Um, I will say that it's the same because I do think when SCP has the ability to SFTP, I think you can manually change the port and it will it will use the FTP protocol instead. Um, yes, yeah, so if you're using when SCP, it is, it, 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 I believe it's like FileZilla. I haven't used when SCP in a long time. Cool. Uh, so this is the cool one. So this is actually, we might actually spin up a server really quick to do this with, um, but we're gonna talk about SSH and SCP. And this might be the last protocol we're gonna go over tonight. Um, and like I said, maybe we'll hop in and we'll we'll log in and do some of these things. We'll copy some files to some servers, but um, SSH um, and SCP. SSH stands for secure shell. We talked about shells. We talked about bash shells and, and, and ZSH and all that stuff. But secure shell is um, basically the method that you use to remotely log into a Linux machine. Um, and this will be done via the command line um, and it'll drop you into the terminal so whenever you need to remote log in to another machine so if, if i've got a server running inside of aws um i will need to ssh into it i will need to connect to a secure shell to be able to um have access to that computer this is um, over port 22 um so that's important it's important to know this over port 22 that port can be uh, modified but again these are all default ports uh, port 22 is almost always what it's going to be scp uh, this is the secure copy protocol. This is um, this is a way for you to also like FTP copy files to uh, from a from a machine to another machine, another remote machine, um, and and use the same it uses the same port, it uses the same protocol to be able to do that. Um, so that one's pretty interesting. This is the this is the command that I use uh, to copy things. Um, I think it's easier, to, a little bit easier to run from the command line, um, and I've kind of just gotten into the habit of running. Uh, SCP, I think, uh, I, I, I'll tell you what I think, and I don't, I, I don't know why I think this. I, I feel like I learned this a long time ago. Don't know if it's true, but I, I want to say SCP is a little bit slower, um, but I think it's a little bit slower. But I think this is over. No, I think they're both over. I want to say that. FileZilla or FTP is over UDP, which means you don't have any of that package protection, uh, that packet protection. Um, let someone let me know if, if I'm right about that. I'm just trying to go for some things that I learned a while ago. I think that's right. Maybe not, uh, but I don't know. I like using SCP. Um, pretty simple for me, and I'm trying to go through some examples of that. But yeah, used against SSH is used against secure access to a shell on a remote uh, on a remote machine. Uh, the cipher handshake process. Yep, because it's secure, um, it's got to go through that cipher handshake process. I thought there was another reason, but um, but yeah, SCP is is slower, um, but I find it to be pretty fast, um, fast enough for me at least. Um, yeah, and then the other one is just used to securely transfer files from one machine to another. So, let me see here. 
I'm not set up on here to be able to log into my AWS account. Am I? Let's let's see. Um, uh, what? Let me see if I can sign in. Um, you already know my email, so I don't care. And you can't see my hand, so you don't know my password. So let's get signed in. I don't want to save. That's definitely not my password. I don't know. Off. And I have two factor authentication, so you can't get in anyway, even if you wanted to. Um, let's go ahead and enter that. So this is just me logging into my Amazon Web Services account. I'm going to try to spin up a quick server really quick so I can show you guys, you know, what SSH is, SCP, probably won't do FTP. Um, but yeah, the best way, um, I'm actually going to do a light sale instance because it might be a little bit faster. And because I don't, I don't think I'll have to set up uh, any um, security rules. Um, cool, 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 cool. Let's create one. Let's create a quick server really quick. We'll do Linux, um, OS only. I don't care about that. We'll go Ubuntu because we've been using Ubuntu. Um, I'll change. I need a new one. Create new. Um, We'll call this uh, Academy. So it's interesting. What you're going to see me do here is um, a lot of servers, a lot of servers you'll, you will, um, you, you can log in via username and password. Um, Amazon and a lot of other cloud providers don't allow you to do that. Um, you have to, you have to use a, um, you used to use a public key, um, you used to use a, a public key, private key pair to log in instead, which is a little more secure, a lot more secure actually. Um, so I'm gonna be using that to log in, but that won't change too much. Um, I'll just show you the difference between them. All right, so I just spun up an entire new server really fast. This is why uh, Linux is great. I I would recommend Amazon Light Sale for little stuff like this. As we get deeper in, into Linux, um, you'll probably see me do more stuff with uh, with EC2. Actually, a little more expensive, um, but you have a lot more flexibility. But for our purposes now, just for a quick demo, this works. So I actually, I can connect to. Cool. I didn't. I didn't know you could do this. Uh, still spinning up, I guess. Cool. So what you need to log into a system is to secure to SSH or secure shell into into a system is you need the IP address or you need the DNS address. Um, because I don't have any DNS addresses set up for this or that are pointed at this, I'll take that IP address and I need to um, I need to go into where I downloaded that file. But normally, normally what you're gonna do is to log into a server, you're gonna do the SSH command uh, to secure shell into a server. You do SSH um, and then you are going to um, SSH with your username. So if your username is, if my username was A Brooks, I was, whoops, I would SSH A Brooks at and I'll paste in the IP address. This is your generic, um, very basic template to be able to SSH into a machine. You wanna SSH as a user um, at the IP address. So uh, so you need to know which user you are and you need SSH at the IP address. Because we are using um, a public key for this, um, first I need to change the permissions of it, of academy.pim. And I need to specify that in my uh, SSH command. So I do man SSH, I'm gonna be passing in the dash I file, which is an identity file. And you can see here, it selects a file from which the identity private key for public key authentication is read. Uh, the default is at a certain location. Um, and so this is, you know, when you get that public key, 
a dash I is how you go ahead and identify what that key is. And so I do SSH dash I academy.pim. Um, and what's the user that I need for light sale? Um, does it tell me? Let me see. I can, maybe I can just type in who am I here? Uh, so my user is Ubuntu. So, um, I don't actually know how you would find this information out. Um, otherwise, maybe if I click on it, maybe it'll tell me, oh, username right here. Username is Ubuntu. So I will, um, and so actually it looks like, oh, okay, it'll actually open up for me. Um, but I can log in from my own command line. Ubuntu at paste an IP address. And it's gonna, the first time I do it, it's gonna say, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? And just, why am I in? Yes, I know it looks the same, um, but you can see here now, my prompt lets me know I'm user Ubuntu at this IP address. I get some information kind of letting me know that I've successfully logged in. And now I'm on to that Linux server. Um, this is not, who am I? Um, Ubuntu and I have config. Um, I can see that my IP address is the, the one that I, oh, this is the internal IP address. But yes, this is, uh, I'm logged into the system. Um, so I'm on a whole, I want a whole nother system here. So what I can do here is that's that's the SSH protocol. That's how you can simply use it to SSH into a machine. But what if I want to copy? Um, what if I have a file locally? So let's say we make let's go into documents. So now just so you know, I'm back on my local machine. You can see here I'm I'm on the mastermind VM. And let's CD into our documents and let's make a document really quick. Let's say we have a document and our document, um, let's actually edit something and let's call it um, um, stream instructions .txt. And let's say we have this file locally that we've been working on and maybe it's uh, just a bunch of instructions on things I need to do to get ready for the stream. And one, you know, update stream page. And maybe number two is, um, um, set up Twitter messaging and maybe it's, there's a bunch of stuff in here. We've got a bunch of instructions in this file and we really want this file um, onto the machine. Um, what we can do is we can use that same protocol and we can kick that. We can, we can transfer that file over the, over that protocol, um, to the machine. So instead of SSH, let's actually take a look at the SCP page. We can see it stands for secure copy. I'm going to copy these files between hosts on a network. It uses SSH for data transfer and uses the same authentication and provides the same security as SSH. So once you get comfortable with SSH, you can see here, I can really almost just uh, take the SSH command that I ran and I can change this to SCP. And then we have most of, we have most of what we need now um, set up. If I change SSH straight to SCP, I still need the dash I um, so that I can send it uh, where I want to send it to. Um, yeah, so um, secure copy, I'm gonna close this. Secure copy is just like the um, Linux copy command. So let's say I wanted to copy stream instructions into the scripts directory. I would do basically copy, I would do the source um, so the source would be the file that I want to copy, which is stream instructions.txt. And I want to copy that into the scripts directory. So that's my destination. So it's copy source destination. That's the, that's the setup of the command copy source, then destination. And if I hit enter and I look inside of the scripts directory, we can see here stream instructions got copied into here and you know, it still exists where we are now. All right. This SCP command is going to be the same thing. So normally it would be something like SCP stream instructions. Um, and then I would do my user at IP address. And then we have to give it, so we, we've given it the name of the server. We have to give it a location on the server. So I'm just gonna copy it into the home directory. So that is the shortcut from home or I could type in slash home or I can make my own directory, but I've got to give it a colon and then the path. Uh, so that's normally how you would need to do it. But because we have that um, identity file, I still have to specify the identity file. So that is back in my downloads. I 
Academy. All right. So again, SCP, and I have to do my identity file because that's how my authentication works right now. Um, so if you were using username and password, you would not have to, you would not have to specify this. You would hit enter. Um, what we have before, because you specified the username here, and then it would ask you for your password. You go ahead and type that password in, and it will copy the file over. But I will hit this, and it does it automatically for me. Um, I don't, I don't like. This is why um, the key pair is a little bit better. Um, it's it's more secure, but it's a little bit better because I don't have to enter in anything. And you can see here, it went ahead and updated completely. Let me know how much data it transferred, uh, at how fast it did it, you know, and how long it took. Um, and so let's make sure that, that file is where we want it to be. We said it was gonna be in the home directory uh, of our Ubuntu user. So let's run that SSH command again. Um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but a, a trick you can do when you, if you ran a command previously and you wanna get back to it, is you can hit Control R in Linux, and this puts you into a reverse, uh, reverse I search, reverse case search, and you can just type in SSH, and it will run back through the history of commands that you ran, and run backwards through them and pick uh, the ones that match. So the last one, the last SSH command I ran was this, um, and so I can run that again if I'd like. But if there were other SSH commands I ran, I could hit Control R again, and it would take me back to that, and I could just keep cycling through until I'm all the way back to the beginning. Um, but um, I can't run the same SSH command because I'm in a different directory. So I've got to tell it where my file is again. And then uh, Ubuntu at. And so I'm already in my home directory. It drops you into your home directory by default. And if I look in here, stream instructions is now on the server. Very, very simple, a very simple way to copy things. I can go back and I can do this with, uh, what else is here? I can do this with the whole zip file that's right there. So maybe I'll just delete this and I'll put cerebromaster.zip. And maybe I'll go ahead and send that over. And you can see this one taking a little bit longer and you can watch the progress here, which is pretty cool. Yes, you can do this. You can do this on any Linux server that has SSH available to it, uh, which is gonna be just about all of them. It's gonna be all of them unless someone shut it down, uh, or locked it down, but um, yes, this you can do this on almost any server. Um, our, the systems that, that we run in our organization um, at work, we actually, for our production servers, um, the staging servers, we actually don't, we actually can't do this, which is, um, a little interesting, we uh, don't actually have any SSH access. We've designed it that way, which is interesting. So we've got to use the tools and AWS that we have available to us to be able to move files around and get files on them as needed. Um, a lot of them just have to get baked in in the build process. But um, yeah, any for any Linux machine, you should be able to, any Linux machine that's connected to the internet that you have to access through the internet will have this available to it um, for sure. Um, so yeah, so let's log back in. And you can now see I was able to upload that zip file to the server. Um, and so it's, it's very easy to get, uh, it, it's very easy to get these files on to the system. UCP to transfer files, uh, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll stick with SCP for now. We'll just stick with SC, SCP for now. Uh, but yeah, it's very easy to get files on there that way. Um, I could do FTP as well. I can FTP from the command line. It would be very similar to the things that we did here. If I was using FileZilla, um, I could do it that way as well. Um, other than that, um, what, did, what will this show me? Two pin. Whoa, when I tell net, I didn't mean that. I meant net stat. My mind broke. Um, so you can see here by default, some things are running, but we talked about port 22 uh, being open. So that's SSH is open. Um, looks like 53 is open. I don't know what 68 is. What is, I don't even know what, what is 53? Um, sounds familiar. TCP port 53. Ah, yeah, DNS, yes. Cool, thank you. So DNS is running on the server um, 22, uh, which is SSH. Um, and then I don't know what the UDP port 68 is, and let's see, let's see what that is. Um, 
Hey, dudes, too high. Thank you for the Twitch Prime subscription. Oh, yes, Etsy services. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Um, oh, that's command to do it. Grab 60 Etsy services. Can you do that? That's, hold on, that's a new one. I'm I'm from the old school. Um, I'm, fr I'm from the old school SysV systems. So this, oh, let me see. Grab. Oh, man. Oh, man. Linux has come a long way. Oh, that's nice. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. That is that is great. This is uh Did SysV have this? If SysV had this, I'm mad at I'm mad at all of uh all Stack Overflow, for sure. I've never seen this on Stack Overflow. I'm mad at everyone who ever mentored me. Uh, I've never seen a single person do this in my whole life. And you've just changed my world. This is just like the other day, a, uh, a coworker of mine showed me, I don't know if any of you guys know about this, this is really cool. So right now I'm in my home directory. Let's say I was in, let's say I was in this .ssh directory. And let's say I cd'd into slash var, uh, let's go lock, let's go log, var log, actually it might not let me go anything in var, um, actually it might, cd slash var, log um journal yeah let's say i go all the way into this directory i went a, a lot of places before so you can see here i see deep deep inside of here did you all know and this is this is uh something that um we made the connection to from git but did you know you could just do cd minus to go back to the previous directory i never knew this you can do this with git as well you can do git checkout minus and it'll check out the last branch you're on but if i do cd minus it takes me all the way back to the last directory do you know how beneficial this command would have been to me uh in in the years that i've been in the industry like, there's been so many times where i had to learn I had to like, be like, oh, what was the path that I was at? And typed it all the way back in. Oh man, you can just you can just CD minus. It'll keep just taking you back and forth. It is, man. I I am. I don't understand how this stuff like this. These little tips and tricks don't usually come up in your day to day googling. Um, so and the more and more you guys come across, tell me more and more about them. I I might not know about them, so let me know about them. And I'm super hype about this grep sixty uh, grep the port number and SE services. I'm really happy about that. Uh, this will be very helpful for to me um, as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, CD, yeah, CD. Um, you can do CD this, and it'll take you home. Um, but you also don't need to do. Uh, you actually don't need to do the tilde. You can just do CD, and it will always take you home. You do not. If you type in CD and hit enter, it will always take you home, and you don't need to uh, to type in the tilde or the home directory. So, yeah, take you right back. But cool, I, like I said, I think you get some time back tonight. That's all the major protocols I wanted to go over. Um, and I, and I kind of highlighted these protocols. There's there's a lot more to Linux networking um, and these protocols and things that you'll, I think you'll pick up over time. But I think all the things that we went over tonight will, um, will make it so that you're not confused when we get into the bigger labs. I think it's next week a lab, um, or is it the week after? Some of the labs I've designed, um, I think this will give you like when I'm copying files over to these things, um, over to the systems that we're going to be setting up, um, things like that. Like I wanted you to, to have some background on the things that I was doing. So, okay, no, yeah, we have one more. So two, two streams from now, we'll be hopping into a big lab, um, that will, that will dig a lot into this. And so I'm going to start, um, kind of deep into, I'm basically going to start this lab uh, with providing everyone uh, a set of files, um, a set of, a set of things to work with. Um, so that we're not starting complete from scratch, uh, as we did with the last one so that we can get through it a little bit faster. Um, but I'm going to be using a lot of these things. Again, we're going to be SCPing some stuff around. Uh, we're going to be, you know, uh, setting up some web servers and we're going to be enabling HTTP and HTTPS. Um, we're probably going to be setting up some SSL certificates and things like that. So We'll be touching all this stuff and i wanted to make sure these were the things that you knew about um and they're very important so take some time watch a video about the osi model again it is like be familiar with it be familiar with maybe like understand what each of the layers uh is kind of talking about um you might get some interview questions about it but um probably not um but i do think it's something that is uh it's good to be familiar with, not necessarily memorized. Um, that's not a, that's not a huge deal. Uh, DNS again, that's how the internet works. That's domain name. Um, 
was domain name service, I believe, um, and that is the transcription from a domain name to an IP address. HTTP and HTTPS protocols, um, those are how uh, text gets uh, transferred. Uh, those are protocols for how text gets transferred over the internet. HTTP being the non-secure one, HTTPS being the secure one, HTTP being over port 80, HTTPS being over port 443. FTP, file transfer protocol, being over port 21. That is how we transfer files uh, from one machine to another. Um, SSL and TLS. SSL is basically deprecated, but people use that interchangeably with TLS. TLS is the new one. This is how you secure uh, or encrypt, encrypt traffic between you know the browser and the server. Pretty important. That is that is that is the thing. SSL and, H and TLS is what makes HTTPS uh, secure. Um, and then we have SSH and SCP, which is Secure Shell uh, Protocol uh, over port 22, um, and SCP, which is Secure Copy over SSH. And that's how you get files securely from one machine to another. Really simple. Um, take a look at this stuff. You know, Google google around um check out you know some other protocols and things like that you saw that we checked out some ports i learned some new things tonight i'm really excited about that um i'm glad someone um told me that apt was app git was was not an alias of apt i'm actually really interested in going to find out a little more about the differences between the two um so i'm going to check that out after the stream is over uh i'm real hyped about this grepping the port number for se services um i usually just do um I usually just do telnet um, dash T U L P N. Not telnet. I keep typing that. I usually do netstat. Um, that's always been my default. And then usually the pin or program like or program name is here, especially when you're running the application. So if I'm trying to find out if Nginx or something is listening, that's my, my usual go to. So this is great. Adding another tool to my belt. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. And so take a little bit of your time back. You know, I took I took a little bit of time from you last time. Take some of your time back. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about this stuff. Um, let me post, let me post these links real quick. I have a few links that help you know a little bit more about DNS. Um, I'll copy them here. And then I'll also put them in the resources, uh, and the resources channel on the Slack. So if you're not in the Slack, hop into the Slack cause I'll post them there. So it'll be a little longer lived, but Oh, whoops, it's easy, easy, copy. These are just some uh, some stuff about, uh, I already posted the FileZilla one, but just some things about um, some protocols and uh, DNS, because I think that's pretty important. Uh, next time we learn how to port forward and proxy with SSH, absolutely. Um, well, maybe we'll learn about proxying and we'll learn about port forwarding uh, for sure. Um, next time should be pretty fun. Um, that is when we'll get to do some some hands-on stuff. You saw me install that web server pretty easily, um, but you'll learn how to kind of manage some web servers. You'll learn how to actually be able to serve up some content. You'll learn about how to do some proxying and and you'll learn how to manipulate web traffic and send it different places. Um, and so that should be pretty exciting. But that's it for tonight. I'm gonna go hop off and try to start recording or finish editing the rest of this video for you all. Um, but have a great night. I'm also gonna get some dinner. So yeah, have a great night and I'll see you all, say Wednesday, I'll see you all on Monday. Peace out.